Good morning and welcome to the second day of the Berlin Conference 2020. Yesterday we had already a day packed with inspiring workshops and panel discussions and nearly 140 participants. For those who couldn't make it yesterday, I'll start again with some technical informations. At the moment, all participants are muted and only for the Q&A sessions later, you can unmute yourself. If something doesn't help here, give us a hint in the chat and our production team will try to help you. If you want to contribute to the discussion later, you can either physically raise your hand or use the hand raise button in, the, in Zoom and we will try to consider both equally. It would be nice if you would turn on your camera and use your real full name, which you can change in the Zoom window. The panels will be interpreted, English or German. And if you want to change the, question, uh, the language, just go down in the toolbar and there you will find the button. Now I wish you a good start to the conference and inspiring talks and hand over to Volker Hassan. Ja, vielen Dank, Frau Lottner. Es ist toll, dass ich euch alle sehe. Ich sehe Istvan Sabo, ich sehe Dieter Koslik Ach, und ich sehe furchtbar viele andere, nicht furchtbar viele, wunderbar viele andere. Ich begrüße Sie herzlich zum zweiten Tag unserer Berliner Konferenz hier aus Berlin. Mein Name ist Volker Hassemer und ich spreche für die drei Initiativen, die diese Konferenz tragen. Es soll für Europe Cities for Europe und wir sind Europa. Wir organisieren diese Konferenz, wie viele von Ihnen wissen, seit langem bewusst am 9. November jenen Jahres. Um zu erinnern an den 9. November 1989 und zu betonen, an diesem Tag ist eben auch das gemeinsame Europa möglich geworden. Wir organisieren diese Konferenz immer mit wunderbaren Partnern aus der Politik, selbstbewusst, eigenständig, aber mit Partnern aus der Politik. Deswegen bin ich sehr dankbar, Hans-Gerd Pöttering, dass ich hier gemeinsam sitze heute Morgen mit Hans-Gerd Pöttering, dem ehemaligen Präsidenten des Europäischen Parlaments in Zeiten, wo Europa auch einige neue Wegrichtungen eingeschlagen hat. Herzlich willkommen, Hans-Gerd. Die Überschrift der diesjährigen Konferenz ist Europe Bottom Up. Das ist unsere Überzeugung, dass Europa, dass die Europäische Union auch die Unterstützung und die aktive Mitwirkung seiner Basis von uns Europäerinnen und Europäern also, sowie ihrer Städte und Regionen verdient und benötigt. Ich freue mich übrigens, dass auch Rafal Dutkiewicz heute Morgen bei uns ist, der nun wirklich inzwischen sagenhafte Stadtpräsident von Breslau, der in einem nicht einfachen Land deutlich gemacht hat, wie dann eine so große Stadt wie Breslau trotzdem rückhaltlos europäisch sein kann. Was also bottom up bedeutet, wollen wir angesichts der aktuellen Umstände leider nur digital auch an diesem zweiten Tage äh, miteinander besprechen. Und heute Morgen geht es darum, dass wir einige Persönlichkeiten aus Kultur und Gesellschaft gebeten haben, ihre Position zu diesem Bottom-up-Approach uns zu erläutern. Wir, ich freue mich sehr, dass so viele zugesagt haben und dass auch viele Freunde von uns dabei sind, die wir seit langen Jahren, mit denen wir seit langen Jahren zusammenarbeiten. But now a little bit English because I know Farid and Miguel don't speak German. I'm really glad that your hosts this morning are Farid and Miguel. I don't know where you are just now in Amsterdam or Brussels or Barcelona or Madrid. I don't know, but you are. I, I see you in the, uh, in the picture. Farid and Miguel are members of a soul for Europe since the beginning. Since the beginning. They are uh, uh, elder than they seem to be since the beginning. Farid, Miguel, the floor is yours. 
Thank you uh, so much, Volker Hasma, and uh, thank you much for the introduction. And <laughs> great to, to have the second day of the Berlin Conference 2020 and sunny greetings from Amsterdam this time. Um, it's going to be a very interesting morning session. As already mentioned, uh, Europe bottom up, um, how we create a shared responsibility for this Europe and what kind of cultural actors can play the role in also based on the discussions we had yesterday when it comes to the roles of experimenting, uh, the roles of the sense of belonging. Very interesting questions we're going to hopefully going to explore a bit further in this morning. How's this morning going to work? Uh, we have three blocks of 30 minutes. In these 30 minutes, we'll have a couple of guests who make some statements and there will be room for a Q&A. After the first 30 minutes of the first guests and a Q&A, we go to the second 30 minutes, another great statements from some guests. And again, there's room for a Q&A. Well, the Q&A is where you hopefully will play a very important role because we'll use the chat for posting questions. So please use the chat for any questions you have during any of the statements of the speakers. Um, and I will then read out these questions uh, out, out loud to some of the guests. So please mention also the guest where your question is for. Um, I'm sure it will be very interesting and I give the floor to Miguel to introduce our first guests. Miguel, floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much uh, Farid. Um, I'm very happy to be with uh, all of you here uh, this uh, morning. I don't know if you can uh, hear me. I'm in Brussels right now. Thank you very much Volker for your nice introduction. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And also we'd like to say hello to get uh, Potterin for being here with us uh, the, this morning. Well, we had a very interesting morning um, and we are going to start talking about Europe bottom up, uh, visions uh, for the success of uh, Europe. Our first, first speaker is Steve uh, Austin. Uh, please confirm me he's uh, there. He's currently director of the MBA Culture, Heritage and Citizenship at the Netherlands Business Academy. He's an autodidactal innovator, developer of new insights and ideas, independent thinker and writer, and he's also a permanent fellow of the Felix Meritis uh, Foundation. Uh, he's also one of the persons behind of this uh, uh, Soul for Europe and Berlin conference, and also uh, has developed many cultural projects. Uh, Steve uh, will be very happy to hear your insights about this Europe bottom up and your vision of Europe for the future. So please, Steve, uh, you have the floor. Is Steve there? I don't see Steve in the in the panel. Yes. No, we don't. We don't see him. Okay, so maybe we'll uh, call him later, and we can go then uh, to the next speaker if he is here with us. He's a theater. Uh, Koslik, uh, he's a German field critic, journalist, and researcher. Uh, he has been the fourth director of the Berlin International Film Festival, the, Ber the famous uh, Berlin, uh, Berlin uh, Nail, and uh, he has uh, been there since uh, 2001 until very recently. So, uh, please, uh, Mr. Koslik, if you are there, we'd like to listen yep. to your insights about this uh, Europe bottom up uh, from your experience uh, point of view, uh, being someone very close to the cultural sector, especially in the film uh, sector, uh, which is your vision of uh, Europe and how can we success in this European integration process? Yeah, thank you very much. Do you hear me? I can hear you, yes, thank you. Yeah, but I will speak in German, is this possible? It is. Okay, so, um, Liebe Freunde von Europa, ähm, herzlichen Dank für die Einladung, ähm, heute Morgen mit Ihnen ein bisschen über Europa zu sprechen. Ich möchte mich gerne ähm, in diesem kurzen Statement darauf konzentrieren, auf äh, die Kultur- und Filmproduktion und Ökologie. Das ambitionierte Programm der Europäischen Gemeinschaft heißt, bis 2050 soll Europa klimaneutral sein. Das sind nur 30 Jahre, eine sehr, sehr kurze Zeit für dieses riesige Projekt. Gerade in Zeiten der Pandemie wird immer wieder betont, wie wichtig Kultur ist. In Deutschland gibt es das Wort systemrelevant, wie wichtig Kultur für die Demokratie ist und für den Zusammenhalt von Menschen. Kultur und Klimaschutz sind zwei Seiten, die die Zukunft unserer Gesellschaft bestimmen werden 
und übrigens auch die Prosperität unserer Wirtschaft. Ich würde mich gerne in meinem kurzen Statement etwas auf den Film konzentrieren. Gerade sind in England zwei große Studien veröffentlicht worden über den CO2-Ausstoß bei Filmproduktionen. Und äh, das Unvorstellbare äh, ist äh, beschrieben worden. Eine normale und mittlere Hollywood- und äh, auch englische Filmproduktion erzeugt zwischen 500 und 4000 Tonnen CO2. Zwischen 500 und 4000 Tonnen CO2. Eine mittlere Produktion liegt ungefähr bei 2.500, 2.000, 3.000 Tonnen CO2. Das ist eine gigantische Menge und sie wird eigentlich nur noch übertroffen von, einem bekannten, von einer bekannten Industrie, nämlich der Luftfahrtindustrie. Nur die Flugzeuge produzieren mehr CO2 als die Filmproduktion. Was bedeutet das eigentlich 500 Tonnen, nicht 5.000 Tonnen, 500 Tonnen? 500 Tonnen CO2, so das Deutsche Bundesumweltamt, mit, äh, ist genau dieselbe Menge, wie wenn Sie mit einem SUV ein Jahr lang 1,7 Millionen Kilometer fahren würden. 1,7 Millionen Kilometer ist mehr als viermal um die Erde. Also es sind schon unvorstellbare Summen, die da zustande kommen und das bei der Produktion von Kultur. Die Kulturproduktion trägt also erheblich zur Klimasituation und zur Erderwärmung bei und das geht vor allen Dingen durch Reisen, durch Transport, durch unreflektiertes Catering, das Fliegen von einem Festival zum anderen, das Transportieren weltweit von Kunstgegenständen. Es ist ein riesiger Zirkus, der einen riesigen CO2-Ausstoß verursacht. Sollten die Klimaziele also erreicht werden der Europäischen Union, dann muss auch im Sektor Kultur sich erheblich was verändern und in Sachen Film muss erheblich anders produziert werden, nämlich grün produziert werden und nicht Greenwashing, sondern Green Producing. Die europäische Filmkultur und die europäische Filmwirtschaft hat viel den europäischen Förderprogrammen zu verdanken. Das 1988 gegründete Mediaprogramm hat bis heute Milliarden in den Kultur-, aber vor allen Dingen in den Filmsektor, in den paneuropäischen Filmsektor gesteckt. Und bis 2027 soll das neue Programm Media Creative Europe Weitere, eine, über eine Milliarde weiter investieren und sie sollen sich, diese Förderungen sollen sich an, der, an den Klimazielen der europäischen Gemeinschaft orientieren. Auch in Deutschland wird immer mehr darüber geredet, was die Kunst- und Filmproduktion in Sachen Umweltschutz tun kann. Aber man muss sich nicht orientieren und man muss auch nicht weiter ausprobieren, ähm, wie man das besser machen kann. Es gibt seit 30 Jahren Erfahrung, wie man besser und grüner und klimafreundlicher und klimaneutraler produzieren kann. Zum Beispiel ein Amerikaner, James Cameron, der die erfolgreichsten Filme der Welt gemacht hat, Titanic oder Avatar, er produziert schon seit vielen, vielen Jahren klimaneutral, nicht klimafreundlich, klimaneutral. Und alle Faktoren, die dazu führen, sind längst bekannt. Es ist also rein eine Frage der Umsetzung und es ist eine Frage des politischen Willens bei der Förderung und vor allen Dingen, und jetzt kommen wir zu Bottom-up, es ist vor allen Dingen eine Frage der Kulturschaffenden, ich sehe die Katrin hier von der EFA, die in ihren Gemeinden und in ihren Städten die Kultur veranstalten und dort real die Kultur produzieren. Der Wirtschaftsfaktor der Kultur- und Kreativbranche in Deutschland das wissen Sie vielleicht nicht, ist der größte Wirtschaftsbereich, den wir haben. Größer als Auto und größer als die Chemiebranche. Und es wird das Brutto, das, das nicht das Bruttosozialprodukt, das Brutto, die Bruttowertschöpfung dieses Bereichs, des Kultur- und Kreativbereichs, beträgt in Deutschland pro Jahr 100 Milliarden Euro. 
10 Prozent davon, also fast 10, 10 Milliarden Euro, äh, kommt, äh, bekommen auf die Filmbranche und Sie sehen, was für ein mächtiger Wirtschaftszweig es ist. Ein gewaltiger Wirtschaftszweig, der ein klassisches Bottom-up-Projekt ist, weil auch Filme werden natürlich vor Ort und Filmkultur vor Ort produziert, auch wenn sie paneuropäisch oder weltweit vertrieben werden. Klimafreundlich zu produzieren ist relativ einfach. Statt nur Flugreisen kann man Bahnreisen, Ökostrom statt Dieselgeneration, Transport, Logistik, neue Technologien. Es ist alles bekannt, es gibt Bücher darüber, es müsste nur gemacht werden. Aber warum wird es nicht gemacht? Weil es nicht in den Richtlinien der Förderprogramme verankert ist. Das ist das wichtigste Ziel, das sowohl bei den europäischen Förderprogrammen als auch bei den nationalen Förderprogrammen die, Klima, die Klimaneutralität des Zieles 2050, 2050 verankert werden muss. Wir haben bei der Berlinale, einem der größten Filmfestivals der Welt und auf jeden Fall dem größten Publikumsfestival der Welt, schon 2010 begonnen, auf ökologische Grundsätze umzustellen. Natürlich geht es da auch erstmal um Kleinigkeiten, keine Pappbecher mehr, sondern Mehrwertbecher, die endlosen Veröffentlichungen auf Papier abzuschaffen, nicht mehr so viel zu fliegen und wenn, dann es zu kompensieren, Elektroautos statt normaler Autos und so weiter und so fort. Aber es geht auch um größere Ziele, nämlich äh, analog den 17 ähm, Sustainable Goals äh, der UN, äh, Programme zu machen und Programme zu präsentieren, die Diversity äh, programmieren, äh, die Menschenrecht äh, programmieren und die Gerechtigkeit in der Welt zeigen. Auch das gehört übrigens zum Klimaschutz dazu und zu einer neuen Welt. Reduce, Reuse, Recycle. Das sind die Wege, wie in Zukunft die Kultur mehr darauf achten muss, um die Klimaziele zu erfüllen. Als wir im Jahr 2010 zu so unserem 60. Geburtstag am Brandenburger Tor eine Leinwand aufspannten und einen gigantischen Vorhang davor hängten, um dort die zweite Weltpremiere von Metropolis zu zeigen, haben wir sämtliche Materialien aus unseren alten Materialien recycelt. Wir haben ein ökologisches Programm aufgelegt, das dazu führte, dass in meinem letzten Jahr als Direktor der Berlinale der rote Teppich grün war. Es ist möglich, dass auch alle roten Teppiche dieser Welt grün sein können. Es gibt nämlich ein Material, was aus recycelten Plastik, aus alten Fischernetzen besteht. Und der rote Teppich war genauso rot, der grüne Teppich war genauso rot wie der rote. Es geht also auch anders. Und ich plädiere dafür, dass diese Klimaschutzziele auch im Kleinen in unseren Förderungsprogrammen aufgenommen werden. Ich möchte damit enden, ein Zitat, was immerhin dazu geführt hat, dass die Welt eine andere Wahrnehmung hat über Klimaneutralität und Klimaschutz, und nämlich von der damals noch sehr jungen äh, Greta, äh, die in Katowice bei der ähm, äh, Klimakonferenz äh, 2018 folgenden Satz sagte, dies ist die größte Krise in der sich die Menschheit je befunden hat, sagte Greta Thunberg da. Und ich finde, dass die Kultur in Europa vor allen Dingen bottom-up dazu erheblich beitragen kann, diese Ziele zu erreichen. Lassen Sie mich ein letztes Wort sagen, weil Herr, Hassemer, Herr Dr. Hassemer das in seiner Einleitung erwähnt hat. Wir schreiben heute den 9. November, das ist für uns für die Welt, aber auch vor allen Dingen für uns in Deutschland, äh, ein Tag, an den wir uns nicht erinnern, viele sich nicht erinnern wollen, aber wir uns immer wieder erinnern müssen. Äh, deshalb ist es gut, dass in Amerika ein neuer Präsident gewählt ist, der nicht nur den Klimaschutzzielen von Paris äh, beitreten, wieder beitreten möchte, sondern ein Präsident, äh, der auch Diversity propagiert, der Toleranz propagiert, und ähm, der auch vielleicht wieder den Menschen ein anderes Gefühl dafür gibt, dass nur mit Toleranz, mit Accept Diversity und Tolerance 
unsere Welt eine kulturelle Welt bleiben wird. Vielen Dank. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Koslik. It was a pleasure to listen to you and uh, to hear you, how are uh, your worries about this climate change and how much the cultural sector can do uh, for it. And you even put some examples on maybe, maybe very simple no, of, of this red uh, uh, carpet, which is a green carpet, in fact, at, at, at the end. And uh, we'd like to, to hear more examples like, like this and maybe it's an example to follow because from the cultural sector, we can also make a lot for this big challenge we are having today, which is the, the climate change. Uh, please uh, don't hesitate to uh, put your questions in the chat uh, for Mr. Koslik. Uh, we will uh, pass them at the end of the first uh, block of uh, speeches we have uh, uh, today. Use the chat uh, for that. And because uh, the time is short and we have many speakers uh, this morning, we are going to the next uh, speaker. I think we already recovered and we found uh, Steve Austin. As I told you, he's, he's currently the director of the MBA Culture, Heritage and Citizenship at the Netherlands uh, Business Academy. Uh, I think he's here with us. Uh, he's a very enthusiastic and also very dynamic person, always finding for new ideas to involve citizens uh, into the European integration process. So please, uh, Steve, if you are there, we are very willing to listen to you. Thank you, Miguel. Um, yes, the bottom up is, uh, of course, a nice uh, slogan. And sometimes people even do understand what you mean by that. It is, uh, it needs uh, a very precise uh, definition uh, to uh, make clear to those who really are promoting the bottom-up principle within the cultural sector for the sake of a wider perspective, um, I would say uh, the citizenship component of all bottom-up activities within and without the European Union is the key factor. The European Commission, as well as the European Parliament, have adopted years, some years ago a definition of what European citizenship should be. Everybody can find that and everybody can learn from that. So if you want to promote a bottom-up activities, you have to realize that bottom-up is an activity based on the recognition of citizenship and the role of citizens in constructing a democratic Europe. So if the cultural sector is willing to recognize that, then a lot of presenters, especially festivals and uh, ECOG organizers, should implement this principle into all their actions. This uh, sounds nice, but in practice, it, it is still a ra rare uh, activity. Therefore, uh, some, in the meantime, more than 12 European cultural and academic institutions have joined this program where Miguel, Juste, Farid and others have joined forces to bring about a format that can be adopted by all those willing organizations in the cultural sector and the academic sector. This interdisciplinary approach have to create a level of understanding first of the definition of European citizenship and secondly, the implementation of this principle in the work of the cultural sector. Otherwise, bottom-up is a 
vague and empty slogan, and I do have the impression that there are enough empty slogans nowadays that uh, are, it is en vogue to launch them, but it is extremely hard to implement them in your daily work. And that is, of course, what we, with this European-wide network of academic institutions and cultural institutions want to bring to the open and uh, let it be an inspiration for colle collegial institutes and individual artists. And what we discovered is that the cultural sector is seen by interested academic uh, institutions and small faculties and postgraduate institutes as an isolated phenomenon that uh, pretends to change the world and pretends to be essential for the future of Europe, but in practice has either uh, intensive and productive contacts with civil society outside of the cultural sector, nor with interesting academics and smaller academic institutes around Europe. So be aware of the fact that if you think that the slogan bottom up gives you the, the, the privilege to find yourself at the right side of the truth and the future, I would say more and more people will be disappointed because you cannot produce any practical result of this interesting and uh, sweeping statement. Thank you very much, Steve, for this. Uh... Uh, let's say communication introduction. I will not say introduction because uh, you always say very strong statements and uh, how important it is uh, to include the citizenship component everywhere, especially in the cultural sector. We can add that to what also Dieter said before about adding diet uh, climate uh, concerns we, we are having. So we are putting things on the cultural sector. I know you have a lot of experience on how to do it and maybe people would like to know more about uh, the samples uh, on how to do that. You have many, so I ask people please to ask in the chat questions for Steve at the end. And we continue running uh, through this interesting uh, morning to the following speaker. Now is Arian Bear who will come to the stage. Uh, he's an artistic director and theater uh, maker at the Festival of uh, Regions in Upper Austria. Uh, he's also art artistic director of the Creative Europe Participatory Project, Orfeo and uh, Manun. And Arian was also the artistic director for the Performing Arts of the European Capital of Culture, Linz, in Austria in 2009. So please, uh, Arian, uh, if you are there, um, if you can come to the stage and uh, the floor is, is yours. We are very willing to listen to you about the your vision of the Europe, Europe vote on up for a successful Europe. Good morning, I am here. Many greetings from Vienna. Good can morning. you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Arian. It's, uh, Zoom is like seance. You always want to ask if, can you see me? Can you hear me? <laughs> I am here. So here's my contribution. <clears throat> in the last weeks and months, all eyes in Europe and beyond were focused on the elections in the United States of America. The once leader of the Western world was in the process of transforming into a failed state. Through the presidency of a politically incompetent, ignorant, arrogant, racist, and sexist, undemocratic, nationalistic, and narcissistic billionaire. The president whose policies and communication strategies are responsible for the deaths of over 200,000 American citizens still received over 70 million votes the second highest number of votes any candidate has ever received in the history of elections in the United States of America. Luckily for the United States and for Europe, or the European Union to be more precise, another candidate received more than 75 million votes, 
the highest number of votes any candidate received in the history of elections in the United States. The gap seems clear, but in the American system of the Electoral College, some states were decided with extremely low margins and two are still too close to call. As a deep sigh of relief is still resounding through many countries and people are dancing in the streets of major cities in the United States, and we believe that the incumbent president has been beaten by an incredible democratic grassroots movement, which combined people from many different camps. The reality is that maybe the incumbent president has been defeated, but Trumpism as a political movement is not. And it will continue to dominate the post-election period and will overshadow the coming presidency. Even in the European Union, Orban's press in Hungary or Janusz Janca in Slovenia chose to side with the unfounded claims that the election in the United States was rigged. The democratic values of the free world are under attack, not only in the USA. The authoritarian populists, also in Europe, continuously undermine everything that was built in the EU after 1945. They incite people against each other. They stir up hatred against minorities. They rely on conspiracy theories. They abolish the separation of powers. They mobilize against liberal democracy, against independent judiciary, and against human rights, against the free media, and against critical art. We are facing division and polarization of our societies by also misusing culture and identity to divide our communities and threatening European integration. However, the European project was founded as a project of common hope to overcome the Europe of the warlike and totalitarian past. The union is the search for a mainland of democracy, of human rights, of peace, and of social equality. While aspects of this dream have been realized, this European dream still lies in the future and may be a land or a continent that we have not fully discovered yet. Arts and culture can and must, and as a matter of fact, as we know, it already does play a role and it can play a much greater role uh, if it is taken seriously. So arts and culture can and must play an important role in this process of reimagining Europe, of reinventing eutopia, which was the title of Lecce's application for European capital of culture in which over 13,000 citizens participated actively and which I had the honor to lead artistically. Artists and cultural institutions have powerful tools to animate processes that can enable us to bring people together. Also bottom up, which is a methodology and not just a vague principle. People to people experiences are key. Difficult or nearly impossible nowadays due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but we hope that with concerted efforts, we can rein in that virus as well as the political undemocratic virus in the near future. While we can be proud of the fact that arts and culture have a significant impact on our economy, we can also be proud of the impact culture can have in making a difference. Culture can make people less worried about the unknown and the new. Culture can familiarize people with new ideas and innovations. Culture is an extreme driver for change. Arts and culture empower people and give them stronger voice in democratic processes and in the shaping of their own regions or in the rethinking of the future of Europe, not only at the ballot box. Art and culture allow people to move out of their comfort zone and change can happen when we move out of that zone. By employing the tools of arts and culture, we go beyond the ever recurring discourse. Not only will we enhance necessary critical thinking, but we can develop strategies for action design. And most importantly, we will do it in playful ways. For the past 12 years, I've been personally involved in large scale participation projects, such as Creative Europe project of Orphil Majnu. I've seen the power of transformation and collaboration that comes with working with thousands of citizens in each participating city. Therefore, I can say from personal experience that I truly believe that the future of arts and culture must be collaborative, participatory, and inclusive, and that we can make a difference in that process. As arts and culture are per definition for the common good, we should unite our energies with other stakeholders committed to the common good, be they engaged in education, social cohesion, uh, climate change, 
ecology, or even the economy for common good. This is a decisive moment for Europe, agitation or peace, tyranny or freedom, climate protection, human rights, emancipation, diversity, and democracy. They are all in play, but these are the values worth working and fighting for. A few days ago, I stumbled over a short film produced by Amnesty International. It is based on the theory of Arthur Oren, an American psychologist, who showed that understanding and reconciliation between two strangers would happen if they look into each other's eyes for four minutes. Perhaps we need to take a step back and before we engage in discussion and formulating different points of view, we just look into each other's eyes for four minutes and discover the human being on the other side or beyond the border. Art and culture has the power to do so. And now is the time for us to engage more intensely. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ariane, for this strong statement and thoughts uh, you share with us about the, this power of culture and how culture can uh, change the things in these dif difficult moments we are uh, living. Maybe we have some hope now with uh, the new, as you mentioned at the beginning, the new president of the United States that uh, can maybe help us to change a little bit the things. But it's true that democracy is under risk right now in, in this uh, cycle. And uh, we, we need culture, we need more culture for that. So please don't hesitate to also to ask Ariane because he can give you more um, inputs and uh, deep, go deeper into uh, his thoughts. But because the time is uh, running and I will just ask you, please uh, be short in the, in the questions because we will not have too much time at, at the end. So we'll try to have at least one question per person, but uh, don't hesitate to use the chance uh, for, for question. Uh, Farid is there to animate you about what you have to ask about just in case you arrive uh, late. Now we are going to the next speaker. In this case, we have a video uh, recorded from Marcel uh, Franzer. He's the president of the German Institute for Economic Research and professor of uh, macroeconomics and at Ulbor University, su Berlin. Uh, he's author and columnist of the economic and social issues. So we are going to uh, now put this uh, video with uh, his uh, message, which I guess will have also to do with some economic uh, uh, visions, but he's also very strong on the uh, defense of the sustainable development goals. So maybe he will give us also some tips on this. So please, can you screen the video from uh, Marcel uh, Branchel? Do we have the video ready? Yeah, I think it is here. Oh, Good morning and yeah, thank you very much for having me join this Berlin Conference 2020. My name is Marcel Fratscher. I speak to you today as an independent academic, as an economist, and also as a European citizen. And as a starting point for my short remarks, I want to focus on this pandemic that we are living through right now. And that is so horrific in terms of claiming lives and livelihoods of so many people in Europe and in the world. Yet a crisis is also often an opportunity, an opportunity for us to become aware of what we value and what we cherish. And this crisis is an urgent opportunity for us to become aware of the challenges that lie ahead of us. And one important lesson of the pandemic is that all the big challenges in the world that we are facing cannot be solved individually by individual nations or regions but that, can, that they can only be solved jointly. Health emergencies, pandemics, the issue of climate protection, protection of the environment and biodiversity, the design of technological change and digitalization and how that affects labor markets and work, migration, and you could go on. All these big challenges of our time cannot be solved by nation states, but only jointly. My hope is that the pandemic will open our eyes and make us realize how important Europe and a strong united Europe is in tackling these crises. And in many ways, we have unique strength in Europe that other regions of the world don't have. In particular, we have seen that in this crisis, countries and regions with a strong social market economy are weathering such challenges a lot better than highly individualistic uh, societies. So social market economy 
on the one hand, having a functioning market economy where the state provides clear boundaries, and yet at the same time, having a strong social welfare state, a high degree of solidarity with the weakest members of our society has been the success model of all of Europe for the past 70 years. And in particular in Germany, it has been the foundation of the Wirtschaftswunder and the welfare and wealth we are enjoying today. So clearly one important lesson from this crisis is that we need to strengthen that model, our social contract the way, the foundation of how we live together in all of you. And also that we need to have more shared sovereignty at the European level to be able to, to tackle those challenges of our time from climate protection to digitalization. To do so, we need to push ahead with European integration. We need to have a stronger single market, not just for goods, but also for services. We need to have capital market union. We need to have the provision of more public goods to all of Europe, all, all Europeans all over Europe. And this includes social services. It also requires that ultimately Europe is speaking with one voice in the global system competition with the US and with China. It is our decision whether global affairs in the future will be dominated in a bi bipolar world by the United States and China, or whether Europe wants to be the third party at the table. And if you want to shape our own future, if you want to shape the, globes, glo the global future, we need to step up and strengthen that shared sovereignty at the European level. My hope is that, we, that th this crisis is a wake up call for all of us um, with uh, helping us strengthen our social contract, the social market economy, with a focus on autonomy, empowering individuals, on universalism, having a strong sense of solidarity and the same rights and opportunities for everyone, and a new humanism, a new awareness that uh, we need to empower individuals and have a high degree of solidarity among citizens to be able to uh, face those challenges. So this is my hope and my expectation. And I hope that we will take the right lessons from this pandemic um, and um, push ahead with a common Europe that is united, but also focuses on subsidiarity, so empowers each individual. Thank you very much. I wish all of us an interesting and exciting conference. So thank you very much, uh, Marcel. Well, even if you there, we are not there with us, it looks like you were there with us. Uh, and thank you very much for this statement, introducing the topic of the pandemic and the crisis we are suffering right now. As uh, Catherine Deventer said yesterday, the crisis is still a crisis and uh, we are all suffering it is something dramatic but uh, as master say we can uh, get maybe some good opportunities for us he just told us how europe is in better conditions because to 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 let's say to fight against this pandemic because uh, we are uh, following a more social uh, economic uh, uh, let's say methodology and uh, that can also uh, make a difference with other countries where uh, the, the, the democracy and the um, political system is not that uh, that good that it, it can be here. Uh, let's go to the next uh, speaker uh, right now. And I want before thank you for your questions because I see the chat is already quite quite full. So let's see if we have time for questions later. And now we'd like to call to the stage to uh, Sherry uh, Sadan. He's a writer, poet and musician one of the Ukrainians well, well known in these uh, three genders, uh, genders. And uh, his social criticism is also widely read in, in Germany, uh, I would say. Uh, he has received numero, uh, numerous uh, awards for his work, and he's also a very active Ukrainian civil society, especially in the conflict zone of Eastern Ukraine. So, uh, Sadan, uh, thank you very much for being here with us, and the stage is uh, yours. Uh, yeah, uh, hello, uh, guten Tag, uh, uh, alle, ja, ich ähm, leider habe keine Kamera, aber ich kann mit Sie sprechen, also zuerst äh, möchte ich danken, danken okay. für diese Einladung, 
für mich ist das Gespräch ist sehr wichtig, weil sie meine Interesse und meine Bedenken hinsichtlich unserer Zukunft voll und ganz erfüllt. Aber dieses Thema ist mir besonders wichtig, weil ich ständig mit den Thesen ihrer Konferenz treffe in meiner Arbeit. Sowohl als Person, die auf dem Gebiet der Kultur arbeitet, als auch als Person, die mit dem öffentlichen Sektor verbunden ist. Aber fangen wir mit der Kultur an. Also die Arbeit im Bereich Kultur gibt Ihnen gewisse Illusionen über Öffn Öffentlichkeit und die Möglichkeit des Dialogs. Die Sphäre der Kultur ist wahrscheinlich die beste, um ein Gespräch zu beginnen. Sie kann uns wirklich die Chance geben, selbst in den konfliktreichsten Situationen zu verstehen. Zweifellos gibt es genügend Möglichkeiten zur Konfrontation. Aber im Gegensatz zur Politik oder Wirtschaft ist die Kultur mit einer viel größeren Universalität ausgestattet. Das heißt, auf die eine oder andere Weise gibt es viel mehr Möglichkeiten, Verständnispunkte. Gleichzeitig ist aber klar, dass Kultur auch Teil der Politik ist. Dass Kultur, die aus der Politik genommen wird, ihre Relevanz, ihren Nerv und ihr Recht verliert, über wichtige und relevante Dinge zu sprechen. Für mich persönlich änderten sich die Vorstellungen über die Möglichkeiten der Kultur, über die Bedeutung der Kultur, im Winter und Frühjahr 2014, mit dem Beginn der russischen bewaffneten Aggression auf dem Krim und auf dem Donbass. Damals wurde klar, wie schwach und hilflos die Kultur war, die Kultur ist. Es wurde jedoch auch deutlich, wie sehr Menschen die Präsenz von Kultur unter nicht normalen Bedingungen benötigen. Es wurde öffentlich Offensichtlich, dass es unter den Kriegbedingungen die Kultur war, die das Gefühl hinterließ, dass das Leben weitergeht, dass es möglich ist, zum normalen Leben zurückzukehren und ohne Krieg zu leben. Dies ist eine sehr wichtige Erfahrung, die so subjektiv wie möglich ist. Aber es ergibt uns einen der möglichen Hinweise. Wir können die Krise überwinden, indem wir uns insbesondere an gemeinsame Werte halten, die Werte der Kultur. Weil äh, wir uns auf die eine oder andere Weise alle in derselben kulturellen Matrix befinden. Wir hören die gleiche Musik, lesen die gleichen Bücher, schauen die gleichen Filme. Dies macht unsere Zukunft nicht automatisch äh, wolkenlos. Aber es gibt uns eine gespenstigste Chance. Kultur, insbesondere die Literatur, bietet eine weitere äußerst wichtige Gelegenheit. Die Gelegenheit zu bezeugen, die Gelegenheit ehrlich und offen darüber zu sprechen, worüber Politiker nicht zu sprechen wagen, worüber die Medien nicht vollständig sprechen können und über welche Propaganda nicht gesprochen werden kann. Für mich als ukrainischer Schriftsteller ist es sehr wichtig, über die äh, tragischen und dramatischen Ereignisse zu sprechen, die sich in meinem Land seit sechs Jahren ereignen. Ich spreche darüber äh, durch Poesie und Prosa, durch äh, Essays und Romane und ich bin äußerst äh, dankbar für diese Gelegenheit, meine Leser außerhalb der Ukraine daran zu erinnern, dass direkt neben uns in unserem Europa, in unserem gemeinsamen Europa ein Krieg stattfinde. Darüber äh, hinaus scheint äh, mir die Ebene der Kultur die Ebene zu sein, auf der solche Beweise überzeugen klingen werden. Daher äh, sollte man die Möglichkeiten der Literatur nicht leicht nehmen. Diese Möglichkeiten sind nicht viele, aber sie sind effektiv, weil sie private Erfahrungen von einer Person auf eine andere übertragen. Hier geht es nicht um Depersonalisierung. Es geht darum, im Gesprächspartner die Person zu sehen. Und doch etwas Wichtiges möchte ich sagen. 
Ebenso wichtig ist mir äh, die These Ihrer Konferenz äh, zur Möglichkeit, äh, zum möglichen Aufbau Europas von unten. Über die Zivilgesellschaft, über horizontale äh, Verbindungen zwischen, äh, Leu zwischen Menschen. In den äh, letzten Jahren habe ich diese Mechanismen ständig überwacht. So kam es, dass in der heutigen Ukraine die Zivilgesellschaft für Freiheit und Demokratie sorgt, die Gesellschaft die Politiker zu Reformen und Fortschritten drängt und äh, die Gesellschaft selbst der äh, Hauptbauer der Zukunft ist. Zehntausende Aktivisten, freiwillige, aktive Bürger bauen heute eine neue Ukraine auf. Es wird als Teil der Zukunft Europas gebaut. Und ich bin sicher, wir sind bereit, diese Erfahrung zu teilen. Es scheint mir, dass äh, dies eine äußerst korrekte Strategie ist, die Mobilisierung unserer Gesellschaften, die Vereinigung der Bürger, äh, der Druck auf die Politik, der Druck auf die Regierung, die Forderung auf der Grundlage von äh, Gerechtigkeit und Offenheit eine gemeinsame Zukunft aufzubauen. Es klingt äh, alles ziemlich idealistisch, da stimme ich zu. Ich bin jedoch ein Dichter und Dichter können sich einen gewissen Idealismus leisten. Die Hauptsache ist, Dichtern zuzuhören, in ihrer eigenen Sprache oder in Übersetzung. Vielen Dank. Thank you very much. So, uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Saddam, uh, for uh, keeping it short and also for this uh, very important uh, message, message about uh, the opportunities that, that uh, culture gives us uh, uh, to talk and to know each other and also to change uh, the, the, the things. And uh, we need it, uh, we need it really. And as you say, let's dream, because poetry also allows us to dream. And if we don't dream, we cannot get something that we don't dream. So let's go now for some uh, questions. I know that my colleague, my colleague uh, Farid was there uh, following the, the chat. I see it's uh, quite full. So hopefully he was able to pick up a couple of questions. Okay. And um, so Farid, uh, the floor is used for the, for the questions. And uh, let's see what uh, we can have uh, as extra value to these uh, wonderful speeches we have so far. Yes, of course, because I'm so glad we were able to use this digital platform for our Berlin conference, because you see already the relevance of this morning when it comes to coming together and sharing responsibility and think about Europe bottom up. Um, I think we have time for two questions because we only have a couple of minutes because then we have to start a second 30 minutes because we really have to end on time. So I will first pose a question and hopefully Albert Edelman can be uh, can give us a short answer. Because, um, um, uh, oh, sorry, Dieter, Dieter Koslik, the question comes from Albert Edelman. It also fits in a bit of a question asked by Caroline Hochleiter when it comes to the importance of art and culture and being together. Uh, yeah, Caroline mentioned the four minute eye contact, uh, but also the question from Albert um, what are the ecological questions? When you do international programming, when you travel uh, because of your uh, your form of art is a physical presence, um, how do we deal with this, and how can we make a difference and change our thinking also for a very physical form of art and culture when it comes to performances? Uh, Dita uh, Kostlik, can you maybe uh, give a very short reflection on this paradox? I would like to give you a sh short reflection on this, but the problem was just in the moment when you asked me, is uh, the sound was gone. So oh. can, you do, can you do it just very short? You're of course, I, I, I can do it short. It's about the paradox that many cultural performances are in real life. Uh, not only the, uh, the four minute eye contact between persons, but uh, we have people who are in the performance arts. I myself in a supervisory board of an uh, international theater yeah. group. Um, uh, we have to travel. It's, it's part of, of yeah. meeting people. How do we yeah. deal with this paradox? Because you also mentioned the, the, the responsibility we yeah. as a sector have to uh, create uh, the opportunities for climate change and, and yeah. change instead of being part of this the is a it's it's a paradox and it's very complicated do you hear me yeah yeah we hear and, you. and it's very complicated to do this but you have to practice this so when we started uh, 10 years ago to analyze uh, our activities at the festival we we needed um uh, also different uh, we looked at all the different actions we have done for example i give you an example we normally have been flying five persons to Los Angeles looking for films for the festival. After, after we have analyzed that this is such a huge CO2 uh, emission, so we just decided only two people. 
Then we decided a lot of different little things. So traveling is the most the bad things if you use if you use airplanes. But you can use trains. I mean, not everywhere, but you can use trains, and you can also reduce your traveling. And you you just have to be careful. And if it doesn't work, then you have to compensate it. So, yeah. for example, our international traveling and also the gas we have been flying in. We had to compensate uh, the CO2 with planting trees and everything. So there are programs. But at the end of the day, I completely understand. We will not solve it entirely because we have to look in each other's eyes. Thank you so much, Dieter Kostlik, for your ideas. And also on the chat, there are many ideas being shared currently how we are going to deal with this. Um, yeah. Uh, a second question is for Steve Austin um, from Jordi uh, Pardo, but also there were questions from uh, Moin Bohebalian when it comes to the importance of education, arts and cultural education, when it comes to creating a bottom-up Europe. Uh, it also is, of, of course, about having generations get used to or getting, uh, getting to know arts and culture. And of course, education plays a role in this. What can be the role of arts and education in many of our societies to create this bottom-up uh, Europe um, uh, for future generations, Steve? Um, of course, uh, artistic education is important. Cultural education should be everywhere. But what I came across in recent years is that there is an immense uh, functioning wide network of, uh, say, um, educational projects, which are not specifically artistic or cultural, but are meant on schools of various levels to educate the pupils to citizens. And there I see immense opportunities to bring the two worlds together and being witnessing the last conference of NACE, Networking European Citizenship Education, in Glasgow, I came to the conclusion that this uh, structures, mainly national or regional, are now facing the end of their capacity in the sense of the result of their education. And they are looking for new formats and models uh, following the uh, aim of the European Union for lifelong learning. Now, isn't the cultural sector, especially the presenters, but also, of course, the filmmakers, isn't the cultural sector as such a fantastic partner in projects aiming at lifelong learning, not particularly to learn art, but to learn citizenship? Yeah, thanks so much. And yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more, Steve, and, and so nice that you combine these two tracks within our societies, culture, arts, and citizenship education, and uh, can be great partners in, uh, in really creating this, not only for the local, national, but also, of course, for the European way of thinking. Um, I think we have a great first 30 minutes and some a very lively chat. Please post your questions, but also share your thoughts on the questions, because that's a great thing about a digital conference. Not only do we have a conversation using video, but we can also have a conversation in the chat. Share your thoughts, your ideas, your good practices, also in the chat, so we can have a dual way of um, having a conversation. Miguel. Next, thank next you. you for the next 30 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Farid. Uh, in fact, it is a pity we cannot have uh, time to answer all the questions, but I also invite the, the speakers to follow the chat and maybe they can answer directly, uh, directly uh, by writing uh, directly to the, to the questions. And that is also a way of uh, interacting with uh, 
with the with the public that these new technologies uh, offer offer us. Uh, we are running away, uh, running uh, right away uh, to the next speaker. He's uh, Mohamed uh, Ridolani. Uh, he's mayor of the city of uh, uh, Leuven, uh, and he was previously responsible for education, sustainability, economic, and urban development. Maybe this also is a, a way of uh, knowing why he stands for a positive change and aims, aims to turn Leuven into one of the most caring, green and prosperous cities in Europe in cooperation with the citizens, knowledge, institutions, companies and organizations. This is what I found from him, but it uh, will be good to hear him, uh, how he uh, plans to make this and how he plans to make it counting with citizens with the uh, approach bottom up. So please, uh, Mr. Ridowani, the floor is yours. Good morning to you all. Uh, thank you for providing me with the platform. It was a very, uh, it's very interesting listening to you, to all the speakers. My name is Mohamed Ridowani. I'm the mayor of the city of Leuven in Belgium. Uh, Leuven is, uh, is an ancient and vibrant city, a uh, university city with a lot of diversity and um, an eagerness to uh, try out new things. But when we innovate, we try to do it together. And um, we do that for uh, the small things and we do that for the bigger things. Why? It's because we have one central question, which is at our heart and we try to answer, and that is, how in the 21st century, how can we restore a sense of belonging? How can we make sure that we tackle one of the most pressing issues of our time next to climate change? And one of the most pressing issues to me is solitude. Is people feeling disentrenched and feeling not part of the whole. And that brings to me um, the things to their essence. Uh, and there is a lot of evidence that if populism is increasing today, if uh, we feel the world is shattered, if there is a lot of polarization, that a lot has to do with uh, people not feeling part of the game, not feeling part of society, not feeling part of a community of a whole. So in Leuven, I try to do what I can to make sure that people feel part of the whole, that they feel connected with their neighborhoods, with the city, with the community, and that they can contribute to it. This is very strong. Um, we do that, for example, when you speak about culture and bottom-up initiatives. Well, and so if you speak about Europe, for me, that's, that should be the mission of Europe in, in also in having a significant future but different from other continents. Because here we do care about the us and the notion of the us, but we need to reinvent it. And we can do it locally because that's where, where people feel connected at the most uh, proxy level. So we have a lot of initiatives. Uh, if you speak about culture, culture is a facilitator because it brings depth, it brings insight. And not only for, let's say the elite, uh, but it should be for everyone. We include culture in all the curriculums of our schools. We make sure that, is, that everyone can, be, uh, can enjoy culture. So because it, it means you can express yourself. It means you can interpret life and you can give significance to your life. Um, I want to conclude that if I speak about bottom-up initiatives and contribution, in Leuven, what is maybe interesting to know is that we went very far in doing it. We did it in a radical way. Here, for example, the climate change. Uh, a few years ago, we did not only make sure that there is a network working around climate change. In fact, in Leuven, we have created a new governance model above the city, where uh, within the city, all layers of society contribute equally and collaborate in an equal way to tackle climate change. So we've created an organization, a new governance model. We divided it in five categories, which each category has 20% of the votings. This organization, in fact, um, uh, oversees all the action plans in Leuven and pushes initiative and makes sure that there is experimenting. We have today more than 180 experiments running in the city. And these five categories, well, it's the city, 
you have the knowledge institutions, you have NGOs and citizens, you have companies and businesses, and then you have the semi-public institutions like public transport, and they all collaborate and um, take the decisions necessary on mobility, on uh, installation of buildings, renewables, greening of the city. And it, uh, in the last years, it has created such a huge dynamic. CO2 is going down. Uh, our city center is car free. Uh, we've done so many projects. But um, what I want to say is that while tackling this issue of climate change, it has at the same time created a sense of belonging because it's not only about CO2 emissions, it's about a community working together to make sure that we advance together. That's so important and so key to me. To conclude, uh, what does it take? It takes leadership. It takes leadership at all levels. So let's invest in the right leadership. Let's start very young with young children, make sure that they understand the world around them and that they are eager to contribute to it, to make it better and to do it with other people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Erdogani. It was also a very strong message and now we understand uh, your project a little bit uh, more, uh, much better and wish you a lot of luck on this. But uh, overall, I would like to underline this feeling of belonging uh, you mentioned several times because it is important to involve uh, citizens and they feel like they are part of, of, of the game so they can also uh, give their inputs and uh, help us to to, to get the, the goals we want to get with, with this. So thank you very much for, you, for your sample. I'm sure there will be uh, questions for you at the end. So I, I uh, call you again to make you questions to the mayor uh, at the end of this uh, panel. Now we are going to the next speaker. Uh, we have a video uh, from uh, Barry Koski. He's the intendant uh, and artistic director of the uh, Oper uh, Berlin, uh, Konich Oper Berlin. Uh, at the end of his first uh, season, he was uh, bought at uh, one of the uh, Opera House of the GR, and he has received uh, many prizes. He, he was uh, very well known uh, for the, his way of uh, directing and uh, managing uh, this, uh, this uh, Opera House. So uh, please, can we put uh, his video and his uh, messages that will be for sure very inspiring to also for us? I don't know if our friends from the technical team are about that. Okay, here it is. Hello, Barry Kosky, Intendant and Chef Register of the Commission Oper Berlin. Uh, I was born in Melbourne, Australia. My grandparents uh, come from Poland and Hungary and Belarus. Um, and I have been living in Europe for 20 years, five years in Vienna and 15 years in Berlin, where I've run this wonderful opera house, the Commission Oper, for the last eight seasons. Um, the themes that you are discussing uh, are very broad um, and uh, there is a lot to say about uh, this subject of Europe and the citizens of Europe and cultural sectors and uh, what is a constructive, positive uh, vision of, of Europe uh, in the coming decades. Um, I don't think I can answer all your questions. I can actually talk about, I think, something very important, and that is what has happened in the last six months during the corona pandemic um, and the difference between a lot of European countries and the rest of the world in terms of the performing arts, particularly opera. Even though we are in a very difficult situation here in Berlin, like a lot of my colleagues, um, we are still 87% funded by the city of Berlin, which means that no one has lost their job. Um, we are still allowed to rehearse and to work. At the moment, we can't perform because we have a lockdown, um, but we are protected by the funded system of German culture. And it's not just about money. The German opera system, as I described a few months ago in an interview I gave, uh, is the Amazon of the international opera world. It's the lungs of the opera. Um, over half the opera houses in the world are in German-speaking countries. 
the history and tradition of German opera houses is extraordinary. The amount of people involved and employed uh, in these opera houses is quite staggering. And the number of tickets uh, and the economic benefits of what the audiences bring to these opera houses is quite breathtaking. Without the German system, uh, the opera, international opera world ceases to exist. And um, this is not just in terms of famous large opera houses with famous singers and conductors. The ecosystem is about the smaller middle houses, around 80 in Germany alone. And these are places where singers from all over the world come to study and to learn, to develop their careers, where directors, conductors, designers, uh, technicians, uh, work from all over the world and are attracted here because of the security and the importance of the opera in the cultural landscape. For an Australian, it, I'm still gobsmacked by how extraordinary uh, the system is. And uh, in the Corona times, uh, because we are still receiving our salaries and still working, and most of my colleagues around the Western world have lost all their jobs, it's made me realize just how uh, extraordinary this system is colleagues and friends in America or in England or Australia, or my colleagues who are self-employed and uh, are not connected with the company, um, uh, are in a very difficult situation. And uh, this system, of course, is not perfect. And this system, of course, should always be looking at how it can transform and metamorphosize into something even stronger. Um, uh, no one is saying it's perfect, but I think I've seen how unbelievably important this system is to the welfare of the future of opera. Um, opera is an interesting microcosm for, for much of Europe, I think. Uh, the day-to-day -day running of the opera house is not glamorous. It's very international. An opera house is one of the most international places you can work. It's a place of collaboration. And it's, when it's good, it's a laboratory of ideas. And the opera developed uh, over 400 years ago from Italy that was traced back of course, in its structure to ancient Greece. And I think the more and more I've thought about in the last few months, it's been actually for the last few years, I've realized how the Greeks got so much right, uh, not just about philosophy and politics, but about theater, about the idea of the communal sharing of stories, uh, about the ritual of performance, um, about the need to express through metaphors uh, and uh, dance and music, things that cannot be explained and articulated in text or in day-to-day -day life. And I think that we, in the rush to uh, uh, have everything explained by technology and the rush to live longer and to put happiness as the center of our lives, which is a problematic idea anyway, uh, we have lost this space for dreaming. And uh, I, 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 I've always been very optimistic about the future of theatre and opera because I think as long as people need to tell stories and need to experience the communal uh, ritual of, of performance, uh, which is a, it's just a human need, uh, there'll always be theatre. I think, I think uh, it's, it's in a way we have to play to the strengths of it. I'm very, I'm very optimistic about the need for it. Um, but I think that we forget that it's one of the only spaces now where you can sit for three or four hours, uh, be cut off from the world, your phone is off, your computer is off. Uh, you are forced, in a good way, to uh, confront yourself reflected in what you are seeing or hearing. Uh, and the only other place that this historically has happened and still happens is a church, a synagogue, a mosque, or a religious place. And so 
the theatre maintains its great mystery, its great importance, I think, because of this. We need these dream spaces. We need these spaces of reflection. What opera does, I think, is extraordinary is because it uh, combines everything. It combines performing arts, sculpture, uh, visual arts, music, movement, uh, philosophy, history, uh, literature. Uh, in a way, uh, the opera becomes, uh, or is a metaphor for much of the European experience. What then can we learn from that? I think that opera houses had to also open up their doors much more in the 21st century. We have to have a much stronger relationship with our audiences. And we have to have a much stronger relationship that we have to go out to the communities, not just sit in an ivory tower and wait for people to come here. Uh, but I think we also have a duty to say um, the opera is special, uh, that theatre is special, that music is special, that the arts are special, and that they form one of the central, I think, three pillars of, of a society, uh, along with education and uh, health. And that a society that doesn't have a strong education system and a strong health system and a strong culture is no society, I believe. And I think that this is something that we need to push people and show that it's not just culture alone, it's the wonderful dialogue uh, between a, a society, a civilised society and, and what that means and uh, how important the relationship between education and culture is. Um, at the same time, I think there's a lot of work to, to be done. I think that there needs to be a lot more women in management positions and artistic positions. I think there needs to be a lot more cultural diversity in, um, in what people's, what the types of people and the types of performance we see on stage and in the audiences. I think we have a lot of work to do there. Um, and um, as I said, it's not perfect in terms of the structures uh, of the system, but it's been a very resilient system um, for a few hundred years and has also transformed over these hundred years. And I think it will transform again, but in a way, uh, um, we have seen in this corona time that culture is not uh, a pastime that you do on the weekend. Culture is something which is nourishment for the soul. And we need food for our body, but we need culture for our soul. And it's as important as the body. And I think if anything, what this corona time has told us in Europe is that how important and how fundamental culture is to uh, the DNA of European identity and how important it is also that you celebrate the diversity of, of, of the European experience. Uh, when I go to Italy, I want to experience what um, the Italian artists and the Italian audiences can offer me. When I go to Spain, I want to experience what the Spanish, and when I go to Poland or Hungary or Sweden or Switzerland or Austria or wherever I want to make sure that I am connecting with the local communities and that this diversity of experience is a fundamental a part of uh, the DNA of, of, of the European experience. And I think that we have to, in a way, approach it from both ends, uh, try and find what we have in common uh, and also find and respect what we have, what our differences are, because without differences, uh, we also cannot uh, move on and develop. So, I, 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 on one hand, I remain uh, very troubled by the world, um, very troubled what's happening politically and socially, very troubled about what the pandemic is doing at the moment. On the other hand, you know, I am an optimist and I think it could be, this time could be used as a very interesting uh, laboratory for what sort of society we want in the future. We are seeing so much change uh, in, in terrible ways around the world, but we're seeing also a lot of change in very good ways. And I think I'm very interested in what the under 30 year olds are thinking and doing and the responsibility that this gen these generations will bear for the future is very, very interesting. We must involve these voices in any discussion we're having about the future of Europe. Thank you and see you later, bye. So thank you, thank you very much to this statement and this reflection of Barry Koski, who was very inspiring to uh, putting uh, the accent on the on the importance of uh, 
culture as the space uh, for reflection and also coming from him who is a master of transformation this power that uh, culture has to transform us uh, i would like also to, to underline these positive uh, messages uh, he gave us of optimism uh, at the end uh, he also mentioned something i want so want also to mention here about the the, the importance of uh, uh, diversity and also uh, uh, having more women uh, on, on culture. We are also having this problem now, maybe in this panel, I should underline that, but there is no problem only for the, for the panel. It's just the, that the women we had for the conference were not able to participate this morning, but they will participate along the rest of the, of the conference. So don't worry about that. We were thinking on, on that. So let's go to the next uh, speaker. Uh, now, because the time is, is running, uh, he's uh, Mr. Isvan uh, Sabo. He's uh, an Hungarian uh, film director. He's one probably most international famous Hungarian filmmaker since the late uh, 1960s and uh, in the tradition of European authorism. And he has made films that uh, represent many of the political and ecological uh, conflicts of Central Europe recent history, as well as of, of his own personal history. Uh, Mr. Sabo, it's a pleasure to uh, have you here with us. Uh, so the floor yeah. is all yours. Yes. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, danke für die Einladung, uh, speziell für Dr. Hassemer. Und uh, ich bitte um Entschuldigung für, für mein starke ungarische Akzent und manchmal äh, für äh, also schwere grammatische Lösungen. Äh, to be honest, I, I heard so many times uh, the word culture this morning. I made notes, so uh, maybe more than, uh, than 150 times that I would like to speak about something else. Thank you. Also, ich möchte von meinem eigenen Beruf ausgehen. Als ich studierte, erreichte das europäische Kino den Standard klassischer Kunstwerke. Fellini, Bergmann, Bunuel, Andrzej Weider, Tarkowski schufen Werke, die die Gefühlswelt des Menschen seine Beziehung zu, ein, zu seiner Umwelt und seinem Schicksal äh, in der Sprache des Kinofilms mit derselben Tiefe zum Ausdruck brachten, wie die großen Romane, Werke der Musik und der Bilder der Kunst jener Zeit. Die Filme wie zum Beispiel Acht und Halb oder äh, Das siebte Siegel Asche und Diamant oder Andrzej Rubjow sind Kulturgeschichte, kulturgeschichtliche Werte, die der Geist der zweiten Hälfte des 20. Jahrhunderts hervorbrachte. Getragen war die Botschaft dieser Werke nicht von deren Beziehung von Worten, Noten, Farben zueinander, sondern von den Emotionen und Gedanken, die auf lebenden Menschengesichtern, menschlichen Gesichtern geboren werden und sich veränderten und so repräsentierten die Emotionen und Gedanken der Zuschauer. Noch vor 15, 20 Jahren waren es europäische Gesichter und Namen, die die Zuschauer in die Kinos der ganzen Welt einluden. Die, Geschichte von, äh, die Gesichter von Mastroianni, Sophia Loren, Alain Delon, Belmondo, Brandauer, Liv Ullmann, haben Millionen ins Kino gelockt. Von New York bis Tokio präsentierten europäische Gesichter die Emotionen von vielen Millionen Zuschauer zu Liebe, Eifersucht, Wahrheit und Gerechtigkeit, Leben und Tod und sozialen Themen. Was ist aus unseren Gesichtern geworden. 
dass wir das Interesse verloren haben. Liebe auszudrücken wie früher das Gesicht von Mastroianni, Eifersucht, Lili Ullmann oder Monika Witti, den Kampf für unsere Wahrheit wie Belmondo. Was haben wir verloren und weshalb? Oder was ist in der Welt geschehen, dass unsere Gesichter nicht mehr wie früher die Emotionen den Zuschauern in aller Welt repräsentieren? Heute sind wir nicht mehr interessant. Nur noch unsere Vergangenheit vielleicht, unsere Museen, unsere Schlösser und Ruinen. Kapitol, Akropolis, sind wir vielleicht schuld daran, vielleicht halten uns unsere Traditionen, unsere Erwartungen an die Kunst vom Wandel ab? Ich fürchte, das Gegenteil ist der Fall. Ich fürchte, dass wir um auf dem Weltmarkt erfolgreich aufzutreten, begonnen haben, aus Zwangserwartungen heraus Mittel einzusetzen, die wir zum Beispiel in meinem Beruf für das Erfolgsgeheimnis von Unternehmen halten, die Filme für den Weltmarkt machen, für die äh, ist es ein aufrichtiges Geschäftsziel für den Unterhaltungsmarkt. Bei uns ist das ein verwirrter Versuch, Filme über die schwer zu lösende Sorgen der menschlichen Existenz stechen daher unverkauflich in der Kategorie Art Kino mit 50, 60 Sessen fest. Und der Filmemacher, der sich daraus befreien will, versucht die Mittel jener Filmindustrie zu benutzen, die ein kleiner Teil der Unterhaltungsindustrie ist. Aber europäische Film wird nicht von Markt sondern von den Steuerzahlern finanziert. Die europäische Kulturförderung verwendet fast überall öffentliche Gelder. Aus diesen Summen können nur bescheidendere Werke geschaffen werden, die in der Programm der großen internationalen Verleihen nicht wettbewerbfähig sind. Aber ich glaube nicht, dass es ein, einen Buchverlag gab, gibt oder geben wird, der zum Beispiel der Pest von Albert Camus in der gleichen Auflage wie ein populare Krimiserie druckt, auch wenn niemanden den literarischen Wert Camus bestreitet. Deshalb denke ich, wir sollten an unsere Werten festhalten und trotz aller schnelle Erfolge auf Antigone, König Lear, die drei Schwestern oder gar auf Godot warten und, wenn Sie so wollen, auf dem Faden von Bergmann, Fellini, Tarkowski, Wandeln nach Lehren aus unseren Geschichten suchen, so die Menschenwerte, die menschlichen Werte und Leiden unserer Welt aufzeigen. Und noch etwas für mich Wichtiges. Es war einmal eine österreichisch-ungarische Monarchie. Sie Umzog Mitteleuropa mit einem Eisenbahnnetz, realisierte es und 
شوف ان مرر اورتن ان بيرغتوم zwang die Landwirtschaft zur Modernisierung, baute Alleen und Boulevards, Operhäuser, Theater, schuf wissenschaftliche und kulturelle Werte, die immer noch präsent sind. Man denkt an Sigmund Freud oder, oder Kafka und sie zerfiel doch wegen der erfolglosen Nationalitätenpolitik. Serben, Slowanen, Kroaten, Rumänen, Slowaken, Tschechen, Ungarn wollten die Unabhängigkeit, eine Form der Freiheit, nach der sie sich seit Jahrhunderten gesehnt hatten. Und der unsensible Umgang Mit diesem Wunsch hat die Monarchie auseinandergerissen. Natürlich ist es oberflächlich gesagt, es gab noch andere Gründe, zum Beispiel die Niederlage im Ersten Weltkrieg. Wesentlich war aber der Nationalismus, dessen Gefühlswelt sich immer stärker der Völker bemächtigte, Und der Nationalismus, den in einen, in einen gemeinsamen Werte voreinander achtenden Patriotismus zu verwandeln, nicht gelungen ist, wobei dies bei sorgfältiger Aufmerksamkeit und viel Verständnis vielleicht hatte Folgen kommen. Das politisches System eines Landes kann man an einem einzigen Tag oder über Nacht verändert werden. Wir haben dies bereits gelernt. Aber die Mentalität der dort lebenden Menschen, das Niveau und die Art und Weise der menschlichen Beziehungen, den Geist, aus den Wurzeln der Vergangenheit herauszuheben, das ist eine wirklich schwierige Aufgabe. Und es reicht nicht, reicht nicht aus, Straßennamen zu ändern und ein paar Denkmäler abzureißen und andere an ihren Platz zu setzen. Vielleicht ist es dies jetzt eine anstrengendere Trainingsperiode. Danke, dass Sie mir Zeit gegeben haben. Thank you, Mr. Savo, uh, for sharing your thoughts and your reflections also with, with us. I think this, this uh, concept of uh, calling back uh, to, the, to the emotions uh, of the people is, is very important. It, it goes very, yeah, much very well also with the, 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 the words from the Major for Loven of uh, to, to, to wake up this feeling of, of belonging to something and also to reflect, and this call you made to reflect much more in our work, in your case, in the work of the film uh, sector, the, the, the emotions, uh, but uh, also to, to reflect the values uh, we, we fight for. And, and I think it is also important to, to have and to consider that in, in other sectors, not just only in the, in the film sector. So thank you very much. I'm sure you wake up many, many questions from the public. So I call you to the public uh, to put your questions uh, because we'll have a few uh, questions moment at the end of, the, of, the, of this uh, panel. But we still have someone with us uh, that I would like to call to the, to the, to the stage. Uh, Uh, she's uh, Nelle Herlin. Uh, we already uh, know her because she was there uh, with us yesterday, but I would like also to introduce her because for me it's an honor to introduce uh, Nelle. He's former vice president of the Academy of Arts in Berlin, member of the strategy group of a Soul for Europe. And I would say she's one of the souls uh, of this uh, conference uh, from the very beginning, uh, running for 15 years already and she's mm -hmm. already also someone who has created many initiatives like this to uh, make people and to uh, promote active citizenship. And Ele, it's an honor to have you here uh, with us in this uh, panel and an honor for me to present to you. The floor is yours. 
Thank you, Miguel. Thank you very much. Um, I would start uh, with a comment uh, Volker Hasselmer uh, said in the beginning. We are on the 9th of November, and the 9th of November is uh, today mostly remembered as the day of the fall of the Berlin Wall. But I think for our history, not only in Germany, but also in Europe and the world, the other memory on that date is as important. It was the terrible start of the uh, of the pogrom, the uh, persecution of the Jewish population in 1938. And this is a date we should always remember, especially today. But looking back into the more recent past, we realized that already for quite some time now, we live in a sequence of so-called crises financial, migration, refugees, climate, and lately the corona reality. All of these threatening facts are not the problem of one country, not of Europe, but they influence the whole world. The actual crisis is not just the pandemic, but also the existence of nationalism, populism, racist developments, and the growing division of the world into rich and poor parts of society all over. Governments and political institutions, although trying to fight against these realities, seem to be more and more helpless. Let me become a bit personal for a moment. I grew up during World War II in a partly Jewish and anti-fascist family. For me, the end of war and fascism meant an opening into a new world that offered my generation the chance to become active for creating a new world to influence and shape the future of our country and society. The movement of the 60s, the student revolution seemed to be a logic reaction, but it was necessary to reach out much further to find ways into larger parts of our society. For me and many others, the answer was the creative power of art and culture, and together we worked on projects and programs, at first motivated by the conviction that it was necessary to make a public aware about all the fascinating artistic developments that had happened around the world, but had been forbidden and destroyed in Germany during fascism and war. And we had been taught that all our neighbors, all the neighbors of our country are our enemies. We now experienced that art and culture could help to cross borders, could create a new curiosity and understanding between citizens and their cities. The idea of networking spread all over. For festivals and cultural institutions, international cooperation and co-production brought new audiences and supported contacts and relationships between cities and their citizens. The creation of the ECOG project 1985 by Melina Mercuri was a very welcome chance for a new growing European spirit. But it was much more difficult to, to make political decision makers and institutions aware about this development from the bottom up of civil society. It needed and still needs, as we see with this Berlin conference, a long process of persuasion and lobbying to convince the political side to become partners and to add to the usual way of acting top down, a new understanding for the added value of a bottom up movement. This is even more important today in a newly dangerous situation. As consequence of the corona pandemic, borders are closed again. That affects heavily also cultural exchange, cooperation and international contacts. Nationalistic movements get stronger. Europe is rather drifting apart instead of developing solidarity. Artists and cultural workers are pushed aside into isolation, threatening their existence and with that, the basis for the sustainability of culture itself. As we know, culture is mostly based in cities and civil society. Here lives the power of changes, of influence. Citizens have to be aware about their chance. They have to accept responsibility to lobby for a common future 
to get active in that new bottom-up process. This is what we want to achieve with this Berlin Conference 2020, a new culture of common responsibility for a Europe bottom-up. The two days of our meeting have, <clears throat> have only been a first step. The real work has to start tomorrow. And I hope we can manage to get all these marvelous speeches we heard today to collect it, to spread it about, and to then have the possibility to react on it much more than we can do in that short time we have this morning. So keep with us, keep, keep on, and uh, let's start together this process, which I think uh, started in a very positive way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nele, and thank you for these uh, thoughts. And I, I think also this uh, very important message you pass to us at the end about this common responsibility, because here we were talking about Europe bottom up and different examples, different ideas. But if citizens don't take the, the floor, they don't take the, the, the role they have and the responsibility, then it will not work. So now uh, maybe the most difficult part will go to Farid right now to summarize, uh, I mean, or to pick up the questions from the public because I see the chat is quite full. So I leave it to you. We just have a, a few minutes uh, for the questions. Yes, well, we're almost out of time. I'm not sure if the mayor of Leuven is still there, Mohamed Ridouani, uh, because it would be interesting to hear some ideas uh, from him. But I think he has already left the chat because officially already we're out of time. But it was really nice to see how they were interconnected, the stories of um, Isfan Tsabo when it comes to uh, the importance of human stories. Uh, they're presented. And also, I think, I think tap taps into the ideas of the mayor when it comes to the sense of belonging and the role of, of local institutions and local governments to create a sense of belonging uh, together with cultural institutions. So my question for the mayor would have been, um, how can you team up? What kind of strategies does he have to empower uh, and to cooperate with the institutions on the local level and make sure that these sense of belonging and these human stories are being shared with each other? Um, that said, I think we're uh, out of time, so it's really important to go uh, to the next session. Uh, Miguel, I think we had a great uh, morning uh, session. In the chat was a real conversation going on, so uh, here we see the great um, uh, bonus of doing a digital uh, uh, this year. Uh, many ideas, many email addresses shared, uh, many inspirations being shared. I'm sure the rest of the day will also be like this. So let's switch to uh, Volker, to Catherine, to uh, present us uh, the, the, the next part of the morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Farid. So let's go then to Catherine and, and Volker, and let's hope that the, the speakers can also maybe comment something on the questions they were put in the chat for, for them. So thank you very much to everybody, and uh, Catherine and Volker will present the next panel. Thank you, Miguel, Farid, for this moderation. Thanks, everybody, for the contribution. We heard we are concerned, we are involved, we are aware, and we want to accept responsibilities. And as Nele said, it's the beginning of a process we invite for on this new culture of common responsibilities for a Europe bottom up. I think it's clear what we heard on so many beautiful personal and institutional levels today that we want to take Europe bottom up serious. Uh, so what does that mean for the principle top down, the principle and the position of politicians? Uh, we invite you at 11.30 in 17 minutes to come back and have this conversation with MEPs that are present with us, members of European Parliament, former members, presidents of European Parliament. And um, last but not least, we are very happy to have EU Commissioner for Culture, Ms. Gabriel, with us as of 11.30 for this conversation. So take a coffee, 15 minutes, we are back for this conversation. Thanks. <laughs>